want to read from you from the Psalms, a beautiful Psalm, Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Let all that I am praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God with my dying breath. Don't put your confidence in powerful people. There is no help for you there. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and all their plans die with them. But joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their helper, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. He made heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them, and keeps every promise forever. He gives justice to the oppressed and food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the God. The Lord protects the foreigners among us. He cares for the orphans and the widows, but is frustrated with the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. He will be your God, O Jerusalem, through all generations. And as God is building his church, let us stand together and say to both of you,
or two, we will have many of our winterized snowbirds be back here with us again. And uh, they're in for shock when they see piles of snow, that's for sure. Uh, we've had our share of what happened to me this winter. Anyways, let's go to prayer this morning. Father, we just come and we want to pause here. Lord, we come again to your house this morning with so much on our hearts and minds. Busy weeks, hectic weeks, bills that may be piling up, all kinds of things are on our minds this morning. And Lord, as we come together today, Lord, may you just speak to our hearts. Oh Lord, as we sing songs today, <coughs> may they be songs that are coming from our heart. May we take note of what we say as we praise you this morning. Meet our needs this day as they need to be met as we gather today. Father, we continue to uphold our camp. What a wonderful ministry we are part of. And one day as we go into glory, Father, we will see many of the faces of the young people whose lives were changed because of us supporting camp. Oh, Lord, bless that ministry. May it continue on for many, many, many more years. Thank you for the children who are already beginning to probably register for the summer. It's not that far away anymore. And we are grateful for the ministry that can't pray for them as they look for counselors and all their various needs. And apparently a cook is a big need. And we pray, Father, that they will find somebody who, or a few people maybe, who can take up the reins of being a cook for camp. Lord, we think of our convention and the goal that they have for 3,000 baptisms and 3,000 people to pray for that ministry and that men and women will be called to the ministry to take up uh, the, the battle of uh, reaching people for Christ. Oh Lord, we want to pray for that vision and, and consider how we can be part of that fantastic uh, vision. Certainly it is something that can fit within the realms of our own visions and directions here at our church. Indeed, it would be such a thrill for us to see people following you in, the, in obedience in baptism as they have come to the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Oh, we would welcome that so much and you would be so pleased and we know the angels in heaven rejoice when one person gives their life to you. We pray again today for those who are uh, ill. We continue to pray for Dalton and we can pray for Eloise as they continue to recuperate in hospital. Oh, thank you for the uh, wonderful progress that they have made and may it just continue, Lord. Thank you for uh, Marsha, who's just been by uh, Dalton's side and has just been a uh, real stalwart for her husband and the whole family. Just pray and bless her and the family through this time. Lord, we pray for those who serve you as missionaries, Lord. We uphold them and sustain them before your throne of grace. Keep them safe. Give them words of wisdom to share at the right time. Give them your patience and endurance to finish the course you have set for them. Bless them this day. Watch over and protect them. We pray in Christ's name. And we just thank you now that we can open the word of God. May it speak to our hearts. May we be encouraged in the word. And we leave here rejoicing for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I invite you to open your Bibles. We're looking at two passages quickly this morning. First one is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to look at verse 28. 
And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administration, various kinds of tongues. And then we're going to skip over to Galatians, or pardon me, Ephesians rather, chapter 4. Starting at verse 11. And it's continu continuation, rather, of the, what we just read in 1 Corinthians. Uh, verse 11. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried away, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects, into him who is head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Today we're going to talk a little bit about spiritual gifts <clears throat> and what does the scriptures teach us about spiritual gifts? Many people have a real difficult time pointing out their spiritual gifts. And really that's really unfortunate. I wish more people could say with assurance that they know their spiritual gift. And perhaps it may be fitting sometime in the future to offer some classes about discovery our spiritual gifts. Anyway, let's pray as we go into the Word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your, your Word. It is paramount to our lives. And Lord, may you speak to us and, and bless us in the gift of the Holy Spirit to our lives and the ministry within the church. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, the teachings about spiritual gifts are almost exclusively uh, done by Paul. As a matter of fact, the only other reference I can find about spiritual gift is in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, where Peter says, As each one has received a special gift, employed in service, one, serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So he doesn't even mention specific gifts per se. But he does mention we are given spiritual gifts to be used in the church. So each one of us, as we sit here this morning, has been granted a gift from God. Each one of you has been given a spiritual gift to use that gift in the context of the church. And I find that myself as a blessing and as a challenge. The practical outwork being the challenge, of course. So let's start by looking at a couple of the word, a couple of words. First off, I want to look at spiritual gifts. Now it's interesting. Spiritual gifts in the Greek is the word charisma, and charisma is related to grace. And so, if we put those two thoughts together, spirit, charisma means spiritual gifts are due to God's grace. Spiritual gifts are due to God's grace. So it is a gift from God. And other than receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior, we don't do anything to receive these gifts. It is a gift from the Holy Spirit to you to use in the church. And when we're talking about our gifts for service within the body of Christ, some have defined it as a God-given ability for service. Christ and the Spirit are the ones who have granted you these gifts to use in the church. 
And I know in every church across the whole wide world, there are a certain amount of people who love to come to church and just come on Sundays and then leave and they don't have to do anything else again. Thank you very much. And they are not using the gifts that God has granted them. God has given you that gift to use in the church. And we need to be using that gift. So I want to begin this morning by clarifying a few misconceptions about gifts. First off, gifts are not a place of, of, of service. Yes, they are used to be used in the context of the church life, but the actual gift is not a place to be. It is to be used in the church. Second, the gifts are not an office. The gift is an ability, exercise. No matter if you hold an office in the church or not, and that is something for those, particularly in every church also, there are those who aren't members, but are faithful adherents. It doesn't let you off the hook that you shouldn't be using your gifts for the Lord. Everyone is given a gift. Everyone should be using their gifts for the Lord Jesus Christ in the church, no matter what church across the earth. Third, the gift is not given to a particular age group. The gift is granted to all, and God intends you to be active using your gifts. I just shared this week, we have been doing some uh, baptism classes with a few young people, and uh, I told them, you know what, ladies, because it's all ladies, I said, you guys are blessed with me by coming through and walking in obedience to the Lord to be baptized. And they're just young people. But it is a blessing to me, and it will be to you as you see them walk through the waters of baptism. It is a great joy for, in the life of the church when people are obedient to the Lord. Young people can bless the elderly, and the elderly can bless the young people as well. Fourth, the gift is not a specialty or a technique. You know, my ability to hack away on the guitar uh, and Adette's ability to play the piano and her mom's ability to do the same isn't necessarily a gift. That gift comes through hard work, my friends. <laughs> many, many hours of practice. And practice isn't fun. <laughs> you know, I sit at home and I think in the court and uh, do a scale. <laughs> And I get so sick of doing the scale, but I'm still fumbling over my big fat thumbs. You know, you got to work at it. So it's not necessarily a gift, but it can, but it is through that which a gift can be exercised at the same time. Charles Ryrie, I came across uh, something he put in a book this week, and, and I need you to try and use your imaginations of a chart. Okay, with three columns, one, two, three columns. And he's trying to explain the difference between natural talents, learned talents, and spiritual gifts. So try and get those three columns in your mind. And under, the first column is natural talents. Under that, he puts, given by God through your parents. And under that, he says, given at birth. And finally, the benefit of people in general. In the second column, he has learned throughout life. And under that, he says, to the benefit, to benefit people generally. Or sorry, uh, the first one is learn, learn skills. And under that, learn throughout life. And under that, to the benefit of people in general. And the last column is the spiritual gifts, the one we really need to focus on. And under that, he has given at conversion. Given at conversion. And under that, he's, he has to the benefit of the church. So if you have accepted the Lord as your Savior, then you have been granted a spiritual gift, my friend. And if you've been granted a spiritual gift, you better use it for the glory of God. Or you're not getting your your uh, jewels in heaven and your crown, all right? You need to be using your gifts for the glory of God. Otherwise, there's some disobedience or rebellion in your life, perhaps. 
Now let's talk about some of the limits of these spiritual gifts. <coughs> First off, they are limited by the will of the agents. And what I mean by this is that Christ and the Spirit are the agents of the gift that is given to you. Yes, we can fine-tune them by playing scales all day long. But the gift is from God. God knows best what the church needs. God knows best and what abilities He will give you to use in the church. I've come across a few people over the course of my life and uh, it's, I don't understand them. Some people, they tell me, you know, God's given me the spiritual gift of a stick. And I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm here to stir the pot. Talk about foolishness. Anybody here feels they got that, that gift? It's not a gift, trust me. It's a problem. <laughs> so, don't believe you have the gift of stirring the pot. Because that's not God given. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Employ it in serving others. Sticks don't serve other people. <laughs> They're just a pain. Not every believer has every gift either. You know, you realize that if you are married, or even if you are single, they are a spiritual gift. A lot of people don't realize that. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7, Yet I wish that all men were as I myself am. And when he says that, he's referring to the fact that he is a single man. I wish all men were like me, he says. However, each man has his own gift from God, one in this manner and one in that matter. So if you want to get married, go ahead. Don't be silly, but whatever state you're in, it is a gift from God. So many young people are so desperate to find their spouse that they're missing the blessing of the garden that they are planted in at the moment. God has given them a special gift for that time. And finally, they are limited by time. Again, Charles Rory said, if everyone, every Christian does not have all the gifts, then it is likely that every generation does not necessarily have all the gifts either. For example, in the early church, they had apostles. We know that very well. But we don't have apostles in the specific sense today because apostles in the specific sense were people who saw the risen Christ. And I know Robert Trites is old, but he ain't that old. <laughs> he hasn't seen the risen Christ. Uh, maybe in a vision or a dream. Maybe, but Apostles are people who saw the risen Christ. So let me ask a question that we're probably all wondering this morning. How do I discover my spiritual gift? Okay, I believe to discover your spiritual gift, you need to start getting active in the church. Now, it may be wise for me to have a class teaching about spiritual gifts, and so many of you can work through some of those concepts and discover together. If that interests you, hey, just let me know. I can make that happen quite easily. So the first thing I suggest is that we take note of the abilities we already have. Take comfort in what God has already blessed you with. Then take your Bible and check those gifts alongside the spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible. And you may be surprised what you find. Second, I suggest you need to prepare yourself, sharpen your natural talents, and work on some of the new spiritual abilities. For example, a good steward in all areas of life may bring you to a life of having the gift of giving unto the Lord. Thirdly, let me suggest you get active again for the Lord. Gifts are often discovered by service. When you are active, doors will open and doors will close. And both are great. Just be 
because a door closes on you doesn't mean it's a bad thing, it's a good thing. Some may discover they enjoy working with teens. Others may enjoy working with toddlers. And uh, neither are better than the other. Both are gifts from God and a blessing to, uh, to the church. Now, I know there are tons more I could say about this topic, but I only have a short time and a rather broad topic. So let me encourage you to get out there and discover and explore your spiritual gifts. Try things. You may discover you enjoy them. Uh, what you currently think you might hate, you might enjoy. So there is another question. What are some of the spiritual gifts? And we read some in, in uh, Corinthians, and it says, And God has appointed a church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, and gifts of healings, helps, administration, various kinds of, of tongues. And we read in Ephesians, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. As I already mentioned about the word apostle, it has very specifically refers to those who have seen the risen Christ, but it also has a general meaning to it as well. As a general meaning, it means one who is sent. So in a sense, we're all apostles at the same time. In a general sense, one who is sent. You are sent, as I am sent, and everyone else. It is generally referred to missionaries. Are you a missionary? I hope so, wherever you are. We learn in the story of Epaphroditus, who was an apostle. Generally, in Philippians it says of him, But I thought it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, minister to my need. So in a general sense, it is someone who is sent. And in a limited sense, it is someone who has seen the risen Christ. Scripture also talks about prophecy. And we have, again, a word that is very general and a word that is very specific. In the general sense, it just simply means to preach. But the gifts of prophecy also meant receiving the message directly from God through special revelation. And some argue that more specific gifts are still in use today. Others argue that that specific gift of receiving prophecy from God is a God, God, bygone error. Now, I could be wrong and, and I'm open to listening, but I have of the bygone error perspective, but uh, I'm willing for my mind and my heart to be changed on that area uh, if uh, the Lord wants to. There's also the gift of healing. You know, I have prayed, and I've told you this before many times, for God to give me the gift of healing. Scripture says you have not because you ask not. And I think we need to ask great things of the Lord. So I have taken that seriously and asked the Lord for the gift of, of uh, healing, but I have never received that gift. But make, make no mistake about it. The spiritual gift of healing is for God-given purposes, not for mine or anybody else's. Not to glorify yourself and say, look what I can do, to glorify Jesus Christ. It is not to give any attention to humanity, but to glory to God. We see so many false teachers and healers on TV today. They lie, they exaggerate, they hide the truth. And so it leaves people wondering today, is that gift truly for today or not? And it appears that it is. But as many of these TV faith healers are abomination with their theatrics that they go through on TV. But we can take hope in some things. God does heal. Period. Whether he gives it as a gift to somebody or not, I, I am not the judge. But he does heal. He hasn't given me the gift, that's for sure. But I know one thing, maybe one day somebody will be healed through my prayers. I don't know. Praise God if he does. But even if he didn't, it doesn't mean, and, and even if he did, it doesn't mean I received the gift. It just meant God chose to heal 
in this situation. That can happen to you. Doesn't mean it has to only happen to a pastor. I've heard many stories of people praying for people in the hospital who were not preachers or anything and just prayed for people and they were healed. It can happen to you. But it is not God's will to heal everybody. Paul prayed and prayed and prayed that God would remove the thorn of flesh he had, which was probably some kind of serious eye disease he had. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. You know, I'm going to work through your weakness. Don't worry about it. God doesn't need to act supernaturally to prove that he has supernatural powers. He doesn't need to do that. God also uses human need, means to heal. God has granted humanity the ability to think, to discover. And many medicines God has given us to help us heal us. It doesn't have to be miraculous per se. Then our list talks about speaking in tongues. Again, there are some who believe the gift of tongues is long gone. And I confess, I used to believe that myself, but I don't anymore. The Bible also says that there must be interpretation of tongues. Now, in fairness, I have heard several people speak in tongues, but I have yet to hear someone interpret those tongues. Evangelism is another gift. You know what? I believe sitting in these pews today, there are many of you who have the gift of evangelism. I really believe that. But I also believe you're frightened and afraid to take the first step. And sometimes you need to do that. I remember when I first started learning my guitar in my first church, <coughs> this is the honest to goodness truth. I only had a repertoire of maybe five chords. And I remember standing up there and well, I remember my first time here I was shaking even though it's been so long since I played. But I remember being up there shaking and playing and there were so many chords I didn't know. So I'd go like this and not hit any strings all the time. Just <laughs> And everybody thought, they thought I was playing. And I was just faking it. <laughs> you know, we got to move out of our comfort zone. It wasn't comfortable for me. Uh, where is the church of tomorrow? We look around our church today and, we're, and many of us are beginning to wonder, and it's a good question, can we do something about it? I really think we can, and I really think it begins by motivating us towards evangelism. We can quite literally knock on doors and say, hey listen, we're from Heartland Baptist Church and we're just going around saying hi to the community, trying to get to know people better. Is there anything our church can do for you? Is that difficult? That's not very difficult. And I think many of us can do it. The hardest part about evangelism is the first door you knock on. First door you knock on. I had this lady in my last church. As a matter of fact, we just ran into her uh, today Sunday. So it would have been, was it yesterday? Do you know where she goes? She's gone? Was it yesterday? Friday. We ran into her Friday at Murray down the road there, and her and her husband. And um, she she went into real estate at, at a later age, 60, I think, anyways. doesn't matter. Anyways, uh, she told me that one of the hardest things she had to do was when she first got to her job as a real estate agent, when she had absolutely no contacts, was to literally open the phone book and call people. And she says the hardest one was the first one. And after that, no big deal, she said. No big deal. The first one is the hardest one. So you can do it. And I can see in the future, we literally knocking on doors of this community. You know, we criticize Mormons, we criticize Jehovah's Witnesses for doing it, but you know what? They're growing because of it. Some people think, oh, that's something of bygone errors. Well, tell me that to the Mormons, you know, the witnesses, because they're growing 
by hundreds and hundreds of thousands every year because they're knocking on doors. We're going to have to move out of our comfort zone. Our list also mentions pastors. Pastor simply means the shepherd. It means providing and caring for the church, protecting it from strange teachings. And it is a wonderful position. It's one that I, and I know most pastors take very seriously. It is a blessing from God. And we need to encourage, and this is what I really think we need to do, we need to encourage young people to consider the call to ministry. Very few are even giving it any thought. Where will the young people be encouraged in their growth in a, in a church and in their spiritual growth if they are not encouraged to consider a call to ministry? And I really think we need to encourage people to do that. And that is one of the goals of our convention, that we as churches encourage young people to consider ministry. The list also talks about serving. This is a gift that so many feel that they have. And so many do. And I think it's a wonderful thing. And I praise God for that category. It is a wonderful service to serve God in the church. Uh, and you are assured uh, that you are needed in the church. You know, whether it's peeling potatoes, setting tables, washing dishes. You're there like with a dirty shirt on ready to go. And that's what we need. We need a lot of people who feel they have that gift. That gift. <coughs> Teaching is also on this list. I can look back on my first, uh, my days of Sunday school when I was a young person all the way through. And you know, as I look back, I remember every one of those teachers. And I have fondness for them. I remember one teacher I had, I hated him at the time, really hated him. But now as I look back, man, he was a good teacher. I really loved him, and he really impacted my life. Now I look back at my high school teachers and junior high teachers and so forth, I can barely remember any of them. I was lived in a, what is considered, literally, I'm not making this up, the most ethnically diverse city in all of Canada, Saint Laurent, where I grew up, just inside Montreal area. And it's very ethnically diverse. And I was looking at my yearbook not too long ago, and I couldn't even pronounce names half the people in there anymore. I forgot how they say their names. Uh, you know, I don't remember my teachers, but I remember those who impacted my life, which is my Sunday school teachers. People, you, when you teach Sunday school, do not think you're having no impact on the lives of people. You are sitting here today because of a Sunday school teacher, I can guarantee you, they've touched our lives. Faith is another gift. All have been given a measure of faith. Employees are a blessing to be in the presence of somebody who has a gift of faith. What a blessing. I by no means have this gift, I don't think, but wow, I love being in the presence of those who do uh, exhorting every now and then you come across a person you know this person is so negative oh they just tear you down everything is negative 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 I have a saying for those people who come across my life when you and they're always so negative and they say you can't do anything good I call them Barnabas now some of you may be what does that mean in the Bible Barnabas is called the son of encouragement so when they're big and negative, I call them marvelous. Sarcasm, I know I shouldn't do that. <laughs> you know, so often the gift of encouragement, though, is self-will, self-determination to have a different attitude. And it's a choice. But you know what? For those who have that gift like Barnabas did, remember Barnabas brought Paul to the apostles. You know, they were terrified of Paul. What was going to happen? Was this for, for real? Barnabas truly had a gift. It, it isn't phony. And it's genuine. And you feel you know, like you can trust that person. And there are other gifts in here. Uh, discerning spirits, showing mercy, giving, and administration, and so forth. Folks, 
There is so much there God has given to each of us in the church. We are told to be good stewards of the gift God has given us. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 2 and 7 says in part, It is required of stewards that they may be found trustworthy. Are you a trustworthy steward of the gift or gifts God has given you? There is so much that we can do in this church in the name of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Let us seek to discover and use our gifts in this church to glorify God. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful today for the gifts. And uh, I pray, Father, if we do not know or understand our gift, that we would begin to seek it out. I really believe many, for example, have the gift of evangelism in this church, but they're afraid. Somebody else can do it. I'm no good at that. But you've given the gift to people to use, and we need to give opportunity for one, and we need to have the courage and boldness to try and see if you will work through us. Lord, help us to discover our gifts, I pray, to use the glorified Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. All right, let's stand and sing this great hymn of the faith together. I'm the keyboard then. Oh, I'm the keyboard. <laughs>